I don't know. Okay, um, so uh, Mark asked me last week to uh, talk for about half an hour, so I'll try to uh, talk to you a little bit through uh, uh, some work that Thorsten and I did um, over the last year or two, but it was kind of rooted in some of the work we started doing at, uh, at CIDR in 2004, so this is kind of a CIDR product. You'll find it in some of the uh, lists, I guess, uh, of what's been done at CIDR. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is um, um, trying to do correlations between uh, seismic and geochemical data uh, at different hotspots. Um, people have done a number of these kinds of things over the years, and so I'll uh, try to talk you through what we've done uh, in that aspect. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, sort of the original things that people have done, sort of map correlations plotted on a map and visually tell me that X correlates with Y pretty well. Um, and then after that, we'll, we'll, we'll go into um, what you can actually do uh, in terms of correlating and actually getting a number, putting a number on those correlations to sort of say, okay, that is actually uh, a significant correlation or that just looks like uh, a nice number or a nice way to correlate, but it doesn't really work that way. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about particularly just hotspot locations and, and observations. Um, and then we'll work our way through some of the uh, data that we tried to use to do this comp comparison. Uh, you'll see that when I said geochemical and seismic, uh, that's only a part of what we actually correlated. We kind of threw everything at it, the uh, kitchen sink included. Um, and so what we'll find in the end, I'm going to give away the, the bottom line here, is that a, a few things correlate significantly. Uh, a lot of things don't seem to do much. Um, so why, why am I interested in this? Uh, I'm coming at this from the geochemical side is, okay, where are things in the mantle? Where, where can we hide uh, RICS ER or where can we have different reservoirs for the different kind of compositions that you sample um, at these nice little hot spots at the surface? Can you remind us what ER is? Oh, the early enriched reservoir, things like that. If, you, if you're talking about geochemical reservoirs, uh, I'm going to try and get, try and limit myself as much as I can to the jargon. But um, the idea is that we need places to store things because we see geochemical uh, signatures that require uh, millions or billions of years to basically mature and age in, uh, from radiogenic systems. Um, and so the question is, where can you put that? Um, so obviously, we're sampling this. And that has not very much depth resolution, right? So we need other things to sort of combine together to get an idea of what this might look like. I think at this point, there's not a whole lot of people that believe this kind of model anymore. Um, and the further down you get, I think we're getting closer to what people think these days. Although, I mean, this is just a, mo a slide of some models. You could use other people's uh, sort of summary slides, if you so wish. Um, and of course, besides having different kinds of blobs and whatnots, uh, on top of everything else, there's small-scale heterogeneity going on within these, these bodies, or whatever you want to call them. Um, so this goes back to uh, Stan Hart's work in 1984. He basically uh, took a map and looked at the composition of a number of different uh, hotspots. Um, and he basically realized that if you look at some of the isotopes, um, there's a group that are essentially enriched in isotopes that suggest they may be the result of uh, recycling sediments or continental uh, materials down into the mantle. They stuck around there for a while, and then eventually, after a few billion years, they came back to the surface in a hot spot. Um, these things in this plot, you see H4 here, you used the uh, lead to OA to O4 ratio compared to sort of an average um, trend, and you find that particularly right here, sort of uh, north uh, east of uh, New Zealand, and then down here in the bottom of the Atlantic, essentially, there's two of these sort of hot spots um, that he uh, nicely sort of contoured. Um, and he called this the DuPaul anomaly after the guys that started talking about this, Dupre and Allegra, uh, initially. Um, now, the first thing you can start thinking about here is um, if you're going to do a contour diagram, 
Um, this is probably not the data set you want to do a contour diagram with, right? There is a very, very few dots on this diagram. So you can draw these lines in a lot of different places. Um, and so this is, this is one of the big problems we have in general is we have a large variety of hot spots, particularly over here in the Pacific. We have almost every flavor in the mantle erupting within a few thousand kilometers of each other. Um, and so that gets tricky. How do you get that close to each other? Um, that's a different question I'm not necessarily going to answer. But um, then in 1988, Castillo pointed out that if you focus on those um, DuPal hotspots, they actually end up plotting on top of uh, some, um, uh, this is I think one of the old Harvard models. Um, basically, this, this seems to sort of at least by eye correlate with where uh, the seismic slow zones are. This is what we're basically looking at in the LSVPs, I guess, uh, at this point. But um, essentially, this is one of the first papers where people started pointing out, hey, there's, there seems to be some sort of correlation here. Um, again, this is done mostly by eye, obviously. The uh, DuPal hotspots are these little blurbs drawn on top of some of these little actual triangles, which would be the actual hotspots. Um, I don't see the arrow. Oh, I think I don't actually know for sure off the top of my head. I think he's just pointing out that this is part of, that that's all part of it. This little blob belongs with this one and that one belongs also with this. I think that's all this is, but maybe Rick remembers. <laughs> um, so the other thing you can do is you can start looking into, okay, so seismic, uh, seismically slow areas seem to sort of correlate with where some of these um, um, EM1 or 2 hotspots lie. You can also look at other things. So um, people have suggested that um, gradients might be important. So here's just an, a, a sort of picture of this. Uh, essentially, this is just lateral gradients near the uh, core mantle boundary and then for a number of different models. And what, what it basically comes down to is that um, if you compare velocities and gradients, it seems like the gradients would actually be hosting a few more of these hotspots or almost twice as many as, as the, the slow velocities. Uh, in general would do. So this is, this is interesting because that, that's the difference between having the, uh, the sort of large zones have hot spots sort of off the top of them or part of them. Uh, that's hard to see I think at this point. Or whether essentially the, uh, the hot spots sort of root in sort of the edge of where these big structures sit. Um, I don't know which one of these is, is really true but um, so people have sort of suggested these different options, right? Um, and so the next thing you can do is you can say, okay, what else do we have back in time? We need to populate the diagram a little bit more with regards to the hotspot locations. And so you can also look at older things, like for instance, some of the large igneous provinces, and basically just use absolute plate motion to go back in time to the time where they originally um, erupted and plot them where they did erupt. And so in this diagram what they did is all these, these locations are reconstructed, all the circles are the large igneous provinces and then the crosses are the hot spots. And what these guys argue is that um, essentially the 1% um, slow contour in this particular model, this is, I think this is S mean, um, basically that sits very close to where the strongest gradients are in the model. Um, and so they made a nice uh, outline of these things based on the 1% being near those stronger gradients. And then if you look, again, a lot of these, uh, these hot spots in, in, in large igneous provinces now seem to be right on top of that edge. Um, there are some exceptions. I mean, Iceland, uh, we mentioned this before, I think, earlier this last week, I guess. Um, but a, a good number of these things are hanging out right near the edge of some of these big structures. 
So again, there's some some sort of relationship it seems, um, but it's hard. This is, we sort of discussed this before. This is with plate reconstructions, assuming that the plates have moved around, right, and that the LLSVPs have been in the same place and yes. the same shape. Yes, and that's actually a, a key thing that you do with all this is you're assuming that what you can do is take the seismology that was done in the last year or whenever this model was created with data from the last few decades and compare it to uh, some long-term uh, history. And this goes back how many hundred million years to um, In this case, I think, I don't think it goes many hundreds of millions. I think, I'm trying to think what the oldest one is here. Um, I wouldn't be surprised so if it's stuff. That's, that's 250, but I suspect that that's one of the oldest ones that's on here. Um, the majority of them are younger than that. But yeah, there's definitely a uh, var variety in there. And yeah, you do not know how much this changed over time. That's definitely, uh, definitely true. Um, the other thing is they just picked this 1% based on the fact that the gradient seemed steep there. And so that seemed like a nice thing and it worked out. Um, I don't know the process of how they actually went through that exercise, whether they just found that that worked out nicely by picking 1% and then that worked with both and those and they went with it or not. That's the 1% anomaly on a certain seismic model? Yeah, on S-mean. Well, so it's this not, is, S-mean is actually an average. Yeah, model. it's an average model, so it's not the, uh, I think, is it only three? I thought it was five. Maybe it's five. Anyway, yeah, so this is an average that model essentially. Um, the idea being that large scale structures should sort of but show up more. It's not going to change much. No. Uh, I mean, if you do this for other models, you get similar results. I mean, I guess you kind of can, you can kind of look at this and sort of see that you have, basically you're correlating dots with these large things and these large things are present in all of these models. Um, the thing that you can't see or that you can, can see, well, depending on how hard you look, is this is all based, well, this I can't say that for, but certainly for this I can say it, is this is all based on a visual comparison, right? You're just visually saying, oh yeah, this plot's really kind of close to that edge. Um, but you don't know exactly what's going on. Now, the other problem with this, well, what is the other problem with this? I'm correlating surface exposure with deep structure, right? Is that right? There's no reason that film kind of is vertical. Yeah. That's, that's, so that's a total assumption too. Is we have no idea. Well, first of all, you'd have to be comfortable with plumes. I think, well, I am. I think some of you probably are too. Well, I know people, some people aren't. Um, then the second part is um, if you are comfortable with them, then you could start thinking about models that Bernard Steinberger makes, for instance. These things might tilt uh, if you have uh, a horizontal component to flow, and they may not be vertical. So the relationship from the surface expression to down to the bottom, who knows what that is necessarily, you don't know. Yeah? Oh, my, um, these are re reconstruction with the, um, the plates moving. Yes. But the assumption, is the assumption that the, the plumes are vertical? In this, in this, you're essentially just reconstructing where things erupted or the crosses are just current hotspots. And you're just assuming that you can correlate that vertically down into the mantle so they're not really paying much attention to it. I think they did look at some of the Steinberger uh, things at some point in their paper as well. I don't remember off the top of my head. So were they using the, the one of the hotspot plate reference frames? Right, you, have, you, you would do this in absolute torque or something because there's different yeah, I, I don't know which. Yeah, Hindu Atlantic hotspot reference frames. Um, yeah, probably. Okay, and so the Pacific ones are all moving. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, particularly Hawaii, right? Oh, well, you know, we could take apart the details, but it's maybe it means nothing, but it's pretty visually stunning. Actually. Visually, this is nice. Yeah, it's, it's impressive. This works, right? Um, so. This one. Then the next thing you can do, and this is what uh, uh, Boshi and Becker did a few years ago, is you can say, okay, well, let's actually try and put a number on this. So let's just compare vertical correlations or uh, tilted plume conduits with seismic models and see where, where they end up. Um, and so it's probably impossible for you to read, but there are, each one of these is a different model, except for this is S-mean again, so that's sort of the uh, average model uh, that they came up with. Um, and what they basically do is they say, um, 
and they're, they're basically trying to see whether um, the um, plume location correlates with a slow velocity at a particular depth. And so the hot spots in this case, here's the blue line, are the hot spots. If you vertically correlate straight through a, a tomography model wh where the locations are with uh, how many are in a slow zone, and you get that blue line for the different models. Um, the other thing you can do, and that's, so this says hot spots S mean, what they did is they used um, essentially, it's a combination of using the, the S mean average tomography model and you can use uh, essentially Steinberger's model for mantle flow so you get an idea of what the tilt would be uh, of these conduits if S mean is the right model to drive Steinberger's model with. Um, but you get some idea of what the tilt might be. Um, and so if you do that, then basically your plumes are no longer vertical, they're now tilting downwards towards where, um, basically they're tilting towards the LLSVPs. That's a, that's a flow model assuming isochemical mantle? Yeah, and it assumes basically that you know um, that the LLSVPs are the density structure that is basically slowly driving large scale mantle flow. Um, so it's a little circular, right? Because you're, you're basically, you're using that to drive the model and then you're basically coming back and saying, look, if I drive the, mo if I drove the model with, with the seismic model, then these things tailor back into the LLSVPs. It gets a little circular. Um, but what you get is that that does work better than vertical correlations. Um, so the, the histograms, by the way, in this are basically, they tested it also against just randomizing their data. So if you randomize locations or randomize, uh, yeah, actually I think that's all they did. They randomized locations and sort of said, okay, what can we come up with for correlations if we just have these things random in the different places? And then you end up with these little histograms giving you an, an, an estimate at least of what you could get as a correlation with depth from just having random hotspot locations. And so it seems that, particularly for the red line, you're, you're above that. It seems significant, right? Well, you, you'll, uh, if you have isochemical mantle, mm -hmm. so when you take tomography, your plume should come from the hottest parts of the mantle, and that's going to be the middle of the LLSVPs. Mm -hmm. So that's going to mandate tilt. If current day hotspots are twice as likely to overlie LSVP edges. So, now if you were to do this again and make those patches chemically distinct and dense, they'd have more vertical. Right, this, uh, that's what I meant. But this is, this is a little circular. You're basically driving your whole model with the idea that these things are driving large scale convection. And so by virtue of doing that, you're going to end up pushing the bottoms of the, of the tails back into the middle of these. Uh, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you're kind of forcing it in that direction a little bit. Yeah. So this, is, this seems significant. At the same time, it's also a little bit, the, the, the difference here might be at least partly due to the fact that you are using that setup. Um, I'm not quite sure how you would test the difference necessarily. So um, the correlations against the location of, of the edges or? It's just a correlation of the hotspot location. What is the current location where we think the plume would be hitting the bottom of the lithosphere? It's kind of like for, for Hawaii, where's Loihi for uh, any of those hotspots, essentially, where's the youngest volcano, that kind of thing. That doesn't tell us whether or not they're coming from the edge of the planets. From the what? From, from the edge of the, of the LLSVPs. Um, no, this, this just suggests that with depth, it, it correlates nicely with, with slow velocities. Okay. There's, there's, yeah, this is not really, this is not, they did not, for as far as I know, they didn't, well, they may have tried gradients as well, I don't remember. Um, I don't think that's in their paper if they did. Um, so this exercise gives you an idea that at least for uh, plume locations, uh, just in general, or hotspot locations in general, there is, there are parts at least where these where these uh, these lines are significant uh, above the randomized sort of uh, set. And if you believe that you can do these tilted hotspots, then uh, it gets even more significant. Uh, so there there would be a correlation of the hotspots are essentially over something that's velocity slow. Um, 
Okay, so how do you how do you compare this to chemistry? Um, obviously, you can you can just compare things to uh, straightforward isotope ratios. Um, the other thing you can do is you can start looking at um, essentially. You, I'm sure you've seen this one a couple of times at this point. Um, you can you can start looking at the fact that we know there's some structure to where these different hotspots uh, lie in sort of isotope space. So this is strontium neodymium lead isotopes. Um, the reason you pick those is because if you do a principal component analysis on the whole data set, those those end up being the strongest three components in uh, a whole set of different isotope <laughs> ratios. Um, and so if you plot the data up for a whole bunch of different hotspot chains, you get these little worms um, that define this sort of tetrahedron shape, the mantle tetrahedron. Um, and the interesting thing that I'm sure has been pointed out as well is that it seems like these things kind of radiate out from this sort of central area, or this, this area here that uh, Stan Dub Fozo and other people have given this different names. Um, C is one of the other ones. Um, and so basically you can, you can just use the ratios or you can start saying, okay, maybe we should also check to see whether particular uh, endpoints here in that compositional space actually correlate with anything specifically. So um, how do we assign uh, a particular hotspot's uh, EM1-ness or EM2-ness or high muness? Um, so what, what you're seeing here, by the way, this is all the data from GeoRock and PetDB that I could get my hands on. Um, and the colors are just all kinds of different uh, hotspot chains and, and then the three ocean basins. And so you can sort of, the way I look at it, it's kind of like a hand with different fingers. There's a bit more fingers than I have. But um, in general, that is sort of the data that you have to sort of look at. And so um, what you can do, you can sort of see it here, a number of these things, these worms are essentially defined by these clusters of dots, right? And so what you can do is to a first order at least is you can try and constrain uh, where that middle point actually is if that truly does radiate out from one point. So what I did here is I just essentially fit a line to all these different uh, data trends and you end up with some central location um, within this tetrahedron from which you can then say, okay, if this is the center, you can just define distances to the outward points. And you can, for each sample, you can just say, where am I in this thing? And you can say, okay, I'm this far along from the center towards EM2 or I'm U. So that way you can actually say for each sample, um, this is a very strong EM2 hotspot or this is a very strong EM1 hotspot or actually it plots pretty close to the middle. Um, so that allows you to give, give your, yourself an idea where it is within this mantle space without having to rely on just one isotope ratio. Now you've actually uh, managed to sort of reduce the number of variables to essentially just one, one thing. How far is it between what, this point and the strongest endpoint it's closest to? So um, that's the way I've approached it. The other thing you can do um, that people have done is instead of doing a principal component analysis on the data, um, you can also say, well, you know, that relies on the distribution that all these samples are being taken from, essentially the mantle being, uh, having a Gaussian distribution, that may not be right. And so you can use what's called an independent component analysis, um, which works a little differently. This is uh, work by Uemori and Albered. And they basically, from a similar data set, um, they extract two independent components. And basically what it does is it separates the mid-ocean ridges from the hotspots, uh, more or less. So, I mean, not something we couldn't have done without doing all the math. But um, that's roughly what this does. Um, and then it has in this sort of vertical direction, the enriched mantle sits sort of above here and the rest sits sort of below here, more or less. Um, and so that's another way you could represent the, uh, the geochemical data. So we also use that as, as one of the things you can use to sort of describe the chemistry. So. What, what are the colors again? Sorry. Oh, um, the cor cor colors just correlate to locations on a map uh, that I didn't put in here. I probably should have. 
but it's basically just different areas, just different latitudes along the ridge. Um, and I don't remember what they are, unfortunately. Um, basically, if you look really, really closely, all the mid-ocean ridges are pluses and are on this side, and then all the ocean islands are little circles and they're all on this side. That's the main thing that you can kind of get out of this. All right, so then you can do this. Um, we now have a truckload of variables per hotspot and we can try and correlate it all. Um, so we correlated age, which just says how long back is there a hotspot track for. You can correlate estimates of the buoyancy flux, uh, estimates of potential temperature, transition zone width, the isotopes, the main three, um, the three hotspot affinities that I just went through, the, iso the uh, independent components, um, some of the velocity anomalies, the gradients, um, plume depth extent, well basically this comes from uh, the Boschi and Becker thing as well. What they do is essentially for a particular hotspot, they just go down into a tomography model and see how far down they can trace it before there's no more slow velocity anomaly. And then they say, okay, that's the end of it. That's how deep as it goes. So that's that. Um, about 200 kilometer depth velocity anomaly, so essentially shallow in the mantle. And then um, how far away is it from continents? So those are all our, our variables that we can determine, at least that we could put our hands on. Um, and then when you correlate everything against everything, you get a nice correlation matrix. And the first thing you notice is it's very yellow. Um, and yellow means there's not a whole lot of correlation, right? So there's only a few things that correlate. Um, a lot of these things don't correlate uh, at all. Um, the things that do correlate, if you look at the plume depth extent, so 21, 22, 23, these guys, there's a, f a few spots here that are a little darker. This one's really red. Um, those, those seem to show a little bit. Um, EM1, which is, what is it, 12? Uh, no, nine. So if you go down nine here, there's a few correlations. We just talked about these already. There's a little bit more here. So it correlates with 200 kilometers, so shallow depth velocity anomalies. Um, EM2, uh, I'm not gonna point them out all. Basically, um, these are sort of the correlations you get out of this mostly. EM1 seems to correlate with some shallower things. Um, actually, there's a little bit of, um, let's see, this is, we'll come back to EM1 in a minute, so that's why I'm looking at this. Um, basically, these are the, 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 deep, or the, the shallower ones um, for a deeper uh, 18, 19, and 20, the, the deeper parts. You're looking at this stretch here, so basically you have, what is that, very little uh, over there. Um, 12 is C, so that's that central thing in the middle of all these isotopes, in the middle of that tetrahedron. It actually shows a number of different correlations, um, but again, it's mostly with the shallower structure. Um, and then there's a, a correlation with potential temperature and, 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 and C, and so, the bottom line is there's a few things that seem to correlate. I'm skipping a few because they're actually part of themselves. So um, for instance, I'm not gonna talk about correlations of isotopes with M members because those are basically related, right? Um, if, you, if you basically distill it down to what actually might be meaningful, you have sort of a handful of things that correlate. And so then you have to start wondering what that actually is. So. Um, the other part you can do is you can say, okay, well, which one of these correlations is significant? And so um, each one of these little symbols, oh, yeah, that's green. That should not have been light green, but anyway. Um, each one of these symbols is just a different M member. And then for each uh, CMB velocity anomaly, you get an idea of where, where the correlation is from that matrix you just saw, and a rough estimate of randomizing the values for that particular uh, thing through these different models, you get roughly just over 0.7 uh, or so in terms of correlation coefficient if you just randomize the data. 
So only a few of these dots, this sits close, this is above it, this is above it, these guys are above it, this one sits close. Um, only a few of these things are really uh, significant. This is the hard part about all this, is trying to judge what's actually significant out of these correlations. Um, and so if you go through that, you again, you don't have a whole lot. Um, EM2 sticks out here against the uh, uh, Princeton model for, for deep, deep anomalies. Uh, that's this can be explained because the Princeton model is all smeared from the Yeah, surface. right, and this is, this is Samoa, just one location effectively that does this. Um, it's, it's, some of these are, are, are hard to deal with in general. It's, it's just not, sh it's not clear that it really means much. Um, then we have over here um, EM1 and uh, plume depth extent actually seems to go to, uh, since it correlates well, it seems to actually correlate, means that it seems to actually continue down fairly far in the mantle. That's interesting how you can actually step down through the uh, tomography model fairly deep uh, and get uh, this EM1 thing to trace. But at the same time, EM1 also sits right here on the boundary for, and, and just below it, for the shallow velocities. So it seems to correlate both at further down into the mantle as well as correlating in the upper mantle. So this is kind of odd. How do you assign affinities for something like Samoa? I mean, it's like, like you rarely sample these different flavors and their pure components. So how do you say, like, what's the C component to Samoa? Um, I'm trying to think of. Let's see. Because so, you can get high three four ratios in Samoa, but it's not. So it's, it's not right, simple. and we'll get we'll get to what you're trying to get. You're trying to get at the helium argument or not? No, 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 no. no the argument is like, well, how do you assign affinity for a certain hot so, spot to one of these mantle end numbers? So, in general, I'm just going. I'm, I'm just finding the uh, um, the most extreme sample for a hot spot. See where it is in here, and I assign whatever distance it is from that central point to the end point. That gives me an affinity for EM2 or EM1 or high mu. If um, the data uh, point plots within the central ellipse, this is essentially an error ellipsoid on my constraint of that middle point from doing this, this intersection, you get a, an ellipsoid roughly of uh, uncertainty around which, or that sits around the, the central point that you we're trying to uh, construct. If my data point, most extreme data point, is still within this, then I just call it C, and that's C or FOSO or whatever component. So if it's inside of this, that's, that's what I call it. That means I'm ignoring the helium here. Um, the problem with any of these things is, is getting enough data together. So if I have to have all the isotopes uh, that I have here, plus helium, plus whatever else you want. You can add more things you would like, but you have to have samples that actually have had all that stuff measured on them. Um, and you may, have a, um, you may have a Samoan sample that's way out here in terms of strontium, but you don't necessarily have helium on it. Now, that may be not the case for Samoa, but you get the idea, right? Okay. But this is an interesting question, especially the A1 correlating shallow and deep, is one way that you could do something like that is to have the components separate. So like for Samoa, you could have the high heating three FOSO component mm -hmm. be in the plume and the EM2 component being picked up in the lithosphere. So we'll get there. So, yeah, oh, <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> um, let's see. So we went through that one, went through that one. So if you then look and actually plot up some of these correlations, so you actually plot up, um, for instance, affinities for some of these things, uh, EM1 or C versus uh, a lot of velocity anomaly or, or depth extent or, or, or a shallow uh, velocity anomaly. This is the kind of plots you get. So for the different, um, the different seismic models are these different trend lines. I've just color coded it the, the same. They're all, all the Princeton ones are red, all the, um, what is it, the, you can't even see it great. Yeah, this, this is almost impossible to see, but the S mean is gray and then the Texas is green. Um, and so the uh, envelopes around it are roughly 95% on the actual slope that you're fitting through here. So 
for some of these, particularly for this one, uh, the Texas model allows you to basically have uh, a horizontal correlation, whatever that might mean. Um, there's a fair bit of slop in, in, in what the actual orientation of these correlations are, and you can see how they, they definitely scatter uh, around the, the correlation. But the bottom line is the, the, the most obvious correlations we have are um, particularly this EM1, both the depth extent with uh, S mean and, and, and the Princeton model having a slope to them, the Texas model not so much. Um, at uh, shallower depth, they're actually anti-correlated a little bit. Um, and then for the, the C component, again, just a sort of a, a, an anti-correlation at shallow depth. And so you have to somehow explain this stuff. Um, so we'll start thinking about this a little bit. This is um, uh, a way to start thinking about EM1. Um, so people have realized, particularly in the, uh, uh, in the Atlantic, that um, there are rocks both in South America and Africa that are old enough to potentially be somewhat related to whatever might be fueling uh, some of the EM1 hotspots that you find along the Atlantic Ridge. And so um, since the 80s, people have argued over whether or not the EM1 source might be in the lithosphere. Um, Rick has done stuff on this as well, um, but he didn't have quite as nice a little picture in his paper, so you can listen. Um, so um, particularly South America has been argued as, as uh, having nice correlations. The interesting thing that you really find with this is that there's rocks here that basically look uh, and, and, and it's essentially the same for here. There are rocks from both sides, essentially, um, that look almost identical in isotopes to what comes out uh, at some of the hot spots here in the middle. And so that, that's actually kind of troubling because that means you have to somehow put material into these hot spots that's continental and that was, if, it, if the continental rocks are so similar, then you bec it becomes a mass balance problem. You need a lot of this continental material in the source to actually get the isotopes over to look like the same thing. Um, so this is a little bit more uh, uh, recent. For the other side, I figured I'd put the African argument in as well. Um, so again, same sort of argument that there's rocks in Africa that seem to look very similar. Um, if you follow the track, um, basically they argue about whether or not the location of the rocks that they, they actually think are related. And if you look at that and then compare that to the absolute plate motion, it doesn't really fit. And so what they end up doing is they end up saying, well, but if there's overall mantle flow, we may be able to sort of blow it in the right direction and get it incorporated underneath. Now, I put this in, in 2010, they actually argued the opposite and they put their EM1 source back in the plume. So I'm not sure that, since that's the newest, I suspect they no longer believe this. But anyway, um, these are, uh, this is one of their suggestions at the time. Um, and so, this is just to illustrate the problem here. Um, the little dots are essentially just uh, some of these EM1 hotspots in terms of their isotopes. And the lines here, the solid lines give you a mixing trend. The dotted lines just give you an extent. In order to mix something, um, some sort of average mantle with some sort of crustal component, um, you need to add a fair amount of this crustal component to start explaining some of the more extreme samples. You need, end up needing 50% or more of this crustal component, lower crustal component, into, uh, into your source to make it start looking like an EM1 basalt. Um, and as I said, that becomes an issue. How do you put more than 50% crustal rock somehow in there? Um, that's a fair bit. So uh, to me, that's still an interesting aspect. I suspect Rick has an idea about this. Um, he probably... Way, 50 crust the source. There we go. <laughs> um, and so I still think the fact that you're looking at this correlation of shallow and deep, it, what it's reflecting is, at least the correlation is reflecting, is you have essentially this is the conduit for uh, one of these EM1 hotspots here. Um, as 
comes out of um, the uh, Steinberger kind of simulation. And then in the, in the background, you're seeing in a very, very hard to see yellow tint um, that essentially just falls right on top of this structure. Now, the next thing you can say is, okay, so now actually we know that your correlation was not related to necessarily a plume conduit. It's related to something really a lot larger, right? So there is a disconnect that you have to think about in terms of what the actually velocity, the velocity anomalies you're tra tra tracking down into the mantle actually mean. Um, they're much larger scale than what the actual conduit probably is. Um, but it did seem to look like there were a number of hotspots that have these correlations with depth. So maybe this is a mixture essentially that you get. You have something coming from deep and you have a contribution from uh, the b bottom part of the continent somehow that's somehow sampling a similar source and essentially South America moves away from Africa and whatever was sitting underneath the two is still sitting in the mantle there or if it's the bottom of the plate it's somehow polluting the upper mantle while the well, South America sort of rifts away in this direction. Something along those lines may be going on. I mean, could the, uh, the upper mantle in that, in that region just have been contaminated by lithospheric mantle material when it, when it broke up? That's, so it's just yeah. ambient contamination. Right, that's the most logical thing, is that there's something in the upper mantle that's left over from when there was a continent sitting there and then it rifts. Essentially, Africa didn't move a whole lot in absolute sense. And so South America is kind of going away and opens up a basin right over where this EM1-like thing sits that we know from the continental rocks. It's sitting in the, in the continents there. Essentially, somehow, it's trans translating into these hotspots. Um, a pollution of some sort of the upper mantle could happen. But again, you, you're, you're, you have to somehow deal with the fact that um, you need to somehow put a lot of this material into these melts to get an EM1-like signature, unless the melt was already something more evolved. Uh, what argues uh, against that the volcanism which sits now on the African uh, continent uh, is formed, um, was sourced by the same plume, maybe the plume head and, and the plume tail uh, have some... Uh, well, what, what, what Klaas and LaRue basically argued is that the absolute plate motion track, which is essentially Walvis Ridge, um, and the, the point, the direction you have to point to get to those rocks that look the same aren't the same. It's a diff there's an angle between them. And so it's not, uh, it's not it doesn't agree in, in angle essentially. That's, that's the bottom line. So it's not sitting over the same stuff. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to say that the bottom line with correlations with C, it seems to only correlate in the upper mantle, um, which is actually interesting because all hotspots sort of trend towards C or FOSO, um, but you don't see the same low uh, or yeah low velocities in the upper mantle in all of these hotspots. So it seems to be intrinsic to the C component. The problem is we ignored helium, and so I'm not sure we can really say a whole lot about this. Um, it's, it's a little difficult. We, we mostly constrained C or FOSO based on where it plots in the, in the other isotopes, and so I think this is a little difficult still. Um, so correlations, um, yeah. There's a lot of correlations you can make. Not a whole lot of things correlate. Um, and then the next step, of course, is if you do have correlations, you can come up with a story like I just did for EM1. Um, but correlation and causation is not necessarily the same thing. So that's where I'll stop. It looked like some of the chemistry is correlated with potential temperatures. Could you say a few words about that? Let's see if we can go back there. Um, potential temperature was four. So, what? It's like your C component? There's, 
There's a little bit here, but that's, that's velocities. Um, I think the main one is 12, yeah. And so the, the thing we wrote in the paper is essentially, um, there's obviously, it's blue, so it's a strong negative correlation between potential temperature and EM1. So really high, or not EM1, sorry, uh, uh, C. So really high C affinity, so being really close into the middle of that tetrahedron, you would have essentially very low um, potential temperature. It, it's kind of weird how that would work. Um, and so the, the thing we, we kind of came up with is this may be uh, related somehow to maybe there's, there's some melting going on that's, that we're not entirely sure of. Um, if, if you think about C compared to a regular upper mantle, um, there's a little bit more enriched isotopes. Maybe there's a little bit more fertility there. Maybe you're somehow buffering the temperature a little bit. Well, if you I'm not low, entirely sure. Uh, low potential temperature of the, the plume, then maybe only C melts and all the other components don't melt. Right. So you would. You don't know. C is the lowest uh, melting, uh, the, the lowest melting temperature then you basically get 100% C. Right, and, but that's, that's the thing is you have to assume that you know what the fertility of the different M members are. I don't think anybody really knows. That's the hard part, right? C, C is presumably the volatile rich component though. Right, by and, and so you can argue that it would be more fertile. That's kind of what we, what we say in the paper, but it's, I think that's, that you get into that, that realm of having to know how, how, uh, how fertile any of the other mental components would be when they get near to, anywhere near the bottom of the lithosphere. Um, and I'm not willing to really commit to that too much. I also think C, most people assume, comes from the lower mantle, therefore it should be hotter. Yeah, and that's the interesting thing here is that you're seeing it in the upper mantle and not anywhere else. And so then you have to think about maybe what you're actually seeing, the correlation you're seeing is just a signature of something else, maybe like melting, for instance, instead of uh, trying to actually trace where the composition comes from as a solid material, that it's a different effect somehow. Um, but Matt Jackson were here, you would point out that some of these isotopic Signatures also correlate with major elements of the of the erupted lavas, mm -hmm. which is pointing to some sort of petrologic like that seems like. Right. Uh, what about correlation with uh, um, age of the lithosphere at the time of volcanism? Age of the ocean? Um, no, we didn't look at that. I'm trying to think. Uh, no, I didn't really look at that at all. Um, the. This is the, the hotspots we included also had continental <laughs> ones in it, but yeah, you could do that. Okay, well, must be more the beach.